Hello everyone, my name is Dave Rice and I'm an audiovisual archivist at the City University of New York and I'm grateful to have the chance to speak to you at this conference. I will be presenting here about workflow development in archival environments and some strategies that worked well for me. I'll focus in particular on experiences and lessons from designing archival workflows for digital materials but I think the concepts that I'll discuss uh, apply both to approaching work with digital materials and with analog materials, as well as designing workflows wherever they are performed by a computer or by a person. Just to introduce myself, I studied uh, film preservation at the George Eastman House, and later I worked as the first archivist at Democracy Now! and then as the first archivist at CUNY Television at the City University of New York. In both of these experiences, I was the first archivist and had to design and establish workflows and services for audiovisual collections. At school, I learned the technical details of preservation, the steps of cataloging, and the procedures to manage collections. However, in these positions as the first archivist, I realized that it wasn't the granular details that I needed the most, but the more general approach to how to design an archive and how to develop and refine workflows for that archive over time. There were two conceptual models that helped me that I'd like to discuss today. The first is a standard called OAIS, or the Open Archival Information System. And the second is a concept known as microservice architecture. OAIS is probably a familiar term to most archivists, and I'll explore what parts of it I found to be the most helpful in archival workflow development. The concept of microservice architecture comes more from computer programming communities, but I found these concepts to be particularly helpful to developing archival workflows that are flexible, resilient, and sustainable. The most familiar part of OAIS is probably this image, which depicts the relationship between three entities and three packages. Here, a producer provides a submission information package to the archive, which transforms that package into an archive information package. Later, a consumer makes a request to the archive and receives a dissemination information package. For digital collections, often the data that the archive makes accessible is different than the data that the archive receives. For instance, an archive may receive a Microsoft Word document, but use a PDF version to provide access. Or an archive may receive a videotape, digitize that uh, videotape into an archival video file for preservation, and then offer an online MP4 copy for access. The archive manages the transformation of the submission information package, or SIP, to the archival information package, or APE, in order to meet the objectives of preservation, and also transforms the archive information package to the dissemination information package, or DIP, to meet the objectives of access. This image here adds more detail to show the functions of ingest and access as an interaction between the producer and the consumer. And it also provides the internal functions of preservation planning, data management, archival storage, and administration. As a new archivist, I really appreciated the simplicity and order of these images, showing the most relevant entities, functions, and sets of data within the entire archival process. The OES model also has a section called Mandates that lists six fundamental functions of an archive. In this slide, I list the first three of the OAIS mandates, and on the right provide a more concise summarization of what the mandate is saying. As a new archivist that was anxious about everything that would need to be done and built and created in order to make an archive function, I really appreciated the guidance of this part of the OAS document. The first three mandates could be summarized as, one, determining what particularly is collected, two, managing and controlling the collections, and three, determining who are the users, the target communities that the archive is seeking to serve. The fourth and fifth mandates of the OAS standard focus on ensuring that the information in the archive is self-descriptive and well-prepared for emergencies. As archivists, the information that we work to preserve should outlast our own appointments. The archival staff and systems that we use may be replaced, added, or removed. But this mandate emphasizes that we should ensure that the information preserved is clear and independent of the staff or systems that support it. The sixth and last mandate focuses on accessibility and authenticity, ensuring that the communities that we strive to serve have trustworthy access to the materials within the archive. The OAIS standard provides far more details about each of these mandates of an archive 
but I can appreciate taking a complex organization of functions and being able to reduce its complexity into general parts, and then dive into the details of any of these. For the archives where we work within, we may excel at meeting some of these mandates, but need help, support, or investment with others. The OAS mandates can give us a structure from which to evaluate our own archive from a more general perspective. From here, I would like to introduce the concept of microservice architecture. I'd like to imagine the opposite of a microservice system as a monolithic system. A system of microservices could be considered as a set of tools, whereas a monolith is a system where all the tools are encapsulated together. Here I show an analogy of microservices and monoliths as a set of baking tools compared to a bread machine. Both approaches can create bread, but there's a difference in the skills, control, and adaptability. In a microservice approach, each tool has a defined purpose, and you can replace, upgrade, or improve each tool individually or add new tools and have some control over how they are used based on your own level of expertise. With a monolithic approach, most of the tools are built together into a system and are not easily replaced or adapted. With a microservices approach, you have more control, more ability to create and evolve your own vision, whereas with a monolith, you follow the instructions. With microservices, you are the baker, whereas with a monolithic system, you are a bread machine user. For archivists, a monolithic system could be considered something like a digital asset management product, an all-in-one system that performs a variety of archival functions by integrating multiple tools into one coherent system. With a microservice approach, though, an archive would have to gather together multiple smaller tools and connect them into a comprehensive workflow. As a student of film preservation, working with archival materials, all workflows seemed like microservice architecture. For complex procedures such as film inspection, film treatment, and film restoration, we learned specialized tools that each performed a particular task with a specific result. If a tool had a better alternative available, we could replace it individually. With film preservation, the concept of a monolithic system was difficult to imagine, as if somebody could create a film restoration machine where you put a damaged film into one slot and receive a repaired film out the other. As archivists transition from working with analog materials to adding in work with digital materials, it can be challenging to conceive of what the equivalent set of tools could be. Archivists may have had decades of refined experience working with analog materials, but we are relatively newcomers at applying these principles to digital materials. As a result, the approach of a monolithic system for digital materials has its appeal. As practitioners, if we do not yet trust ourselves with digital materials, then outsourcing that trust to a vendor of a monolithic system can be attractive. A microservice approach requires more responsibility within the archive, but there are a number of reasons that a microservice approach is preferable. These include when the staff has or is willing to acquire comprehensive technical knowledge of its objects, processes, and tools, or when the design of workflows is required to be agile and responsive, or when the responsibility for the function, maintenance, and design of archival functions is appropriate to rest on the archive's personnel rather than on an outsourced company, or when the opportunity for a monolith is not worth the cost of a long-term investment. With this last point, we should remember that as archivists, we aspire to sustain our collections, whereas the systems that we are using to sustain those collections are temporarily temporary and replaced as needed. Now let's return to OAS stuff. We know that an archive will receive a submission information package, process it into an archival information package for storage, and then make it available as a dissemination information package. But what is happening to convert one package into another? An archive information package must be prepared for the objectives of preservation, whereas a dissemination information package must be easy for consumers to work with. At CUNY Television, here is an example of a submission information package. Here the producer delivers a television episode. Here it is comprised of two video files. And the producer also completes a form to provide descriptive metadata. The archive information package is certainly more complex. The original two video files are still here in the package, but now there is a set of metadata to support the preservation of the object, 
Now we have checksums and logs of each function in the metadata directory. We also have several derivatives, including a version for broadcast or editing, a version to upload to YouTube, an MP3 audio file to help with transcription, and a set of representational images. By converting a submission information package to an archive information package, we are working to ensure that the information is better able to meet the OAS mandates, particularly making it self-descriptive, preparing for emergencies, and in support of making collections accessible. Archival workflows can be easier to maintain if the process for submitting information is well-defined. Let's consider how YouTube manages the submission of information as an example. Here is a YouTube submission form, where a user can provide a video file along with very basic descriptive metadata, such as a title and description. The interface that YouTube provides controls and constrains how the information is received. From the submission data, YouTube then adds a lot of its own information to create its version of the archive information package, including captions, reviews, content flags, derivatives, and technical information. So I'd like to share the story of my first microservice. In my first job as an archivist at Democracy Now!, I was managing a preservation project to work with several thousand CDs and to transfer the data from the disks to audio files for preservation and access. I designed an archival information package like this, with FLAC audio files to preserve the audio, MP3 files to make the audio accessible, and log files to document the process. I began to comprehend the very repetitive work of making this type of folder thousands of times, ripping CDs by running individual commands, naming every file just right, and logging all of the results. To think about repeating this tedious process for thousands of times, I was discouraged. Archival work can often feel menial, and I was not looking forward to operating in a workflow like this as a human for thousands and thousands of compact disk operations. I showed my workflow plans to an IT collaborator, and he wrote me this short 18-line bash script. When I ran this little program, it would ask me to enter the identifier of the CD, then it would make all the folders, rip the CD, make all the files of the right names, create the MP3 derivatives, log all the procedures, and then eject the disk. From my perspective, I would enter a CD identifier, it would do everything, and then eject, and I would repeat this process. At the time, I was amazed that such a short program could save me such an enormous amount of time and certainly make the results more accurate and just be able to automate most of the workflow. Just as I was determined earlier to learn the tools of film preservation at school, now I felt the same desire to learn how to develop such microservices to enact archival workflows that I would design efficiently. Uh, this script used open source tools such as CD Paranoia and FLAC from here, I would learn about other building blocks for audiovisual archival microservices, such as Media Info and FFmpeg. In my present job at CUNY Television, this is an example of the current microservice set that I work with. This is a set of several dozen small computer scripts that each do a small piece of a greater archival workflow, with some scripts that chain others into an assembly line. These scripts are our microservices that transform the submission information package into the archive information package in our environment so that we can prepare managed information for preservation and access. These scripts do things such as make access copies, make checksums, uh, verify that everything meets our expectations. Over time, we would continue to evolve and add to these as we would add in more automation, more quality control, and more types of derivatives. It is certainly an ongoing work in, process, in progress. The approach of developing and maintaining microservices is used by several archives. As microservices often build upon open source tools, we can often share our work in microservice development with the same open source spirit. Uh, this image is from a collection called Open Workflows on GitHub, and provides links to collections of microservices under development at various archival organizations that happen to share their work. For those considering taking a microservice-based approach, I recommend these objectives as a starting point. First would be a packager script, which takes your submission information package and moves it into a directory structure that organizes the preservation materials and the access materials and the associated metadata 
so that each file has a clear role to play. Next, I would generate, uh, uh, next I would take steps to generate technical metadata from the preservation materials. In audiovisual collections, we often use FFmpeg, MediaInfo, and EXIF tool to do this. Making derivatives, such as files for online or in-person access, is also essential, as often the preservation materials themselves aren't also efficient as access copies. Lastly, workflows are needed to create checksums for preservation materials, as well as a method to validate the archive information package to ensure that the data is authentic and consistent over time. Much of this presentation is based on a paper that I wrote with Annie Swikert called Microservices in Audiovisual Archives, which is available under a Creative Commons license from IASA. In this paper, we go into far more technical detail about microservice development for audiovisual archives. And with that, I want to thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, here is a link to the slides that I presented today in case you want to review or access anything that I talked about. Thanks so much.